Thanks to Ray Rickman for coming in as he does every Thursday to give his big view. Appreciate the former state representative and deputy secretary of state coming into studio here at the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. Speaking of politicians, we do have a familiar face. He's been in studio here before. I'm very uh, eager to hear what he has to say. Former United States Senator and Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Chafee. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'll let you take a seat. Sometimes we stand, sometimes we sit. Yeah, so first. <laughs> first time for everything. Yes. Well, I appreciate your coming in. There's been so much that's been happening since we talked last. And one of the things I did want to start off talking with you about, you were governor, you were the head de facto of the Rhode Island State Police. Talk with us about your reaction to what you saw transpire on Thursday, the reaction both from Governor Raimondo and the State Police since. Um, you know, it's not an easy job. What were your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'll give Bill Local a lot of credit for the coverage. Uh, you were all over it and had those videos up. I don't know where you got them, but uh, they were very instructive uh, for the public to see right away. So uh, congratulations to Go Local. Uh, my reaction is so similar to so many Rhode Islanders. Uh, uh, we understand that in a hyper situation such as this, uh, emotions sometimes can take hold, but at the same time, it just seems like a rolling succession of little mistakes that ended up uh, with a big mistake. And in these situations, as governor, you know, as the de facto head, how much communication is there between the governor and the state police when something like this happens and you want to get to the bottom of it? Well, these things don't happen that often. Uh, when I was mayor, we had a shooting, uh, a, uh, somebody that uh, had stolen uh, some from a uh, convenience store. Mm. He was uh, stopped on 95 and wouldn't obey commands and the police ended up killing him. Uh, but you want to have a review, a uh, thorough review and go through all the procedures and they're saying on this one the procedures were followed. Uh, it, it seems as though, it, for instance, having the prisoner in the car with the car running, the police car running, uh, is not a good procedure uh, while he's handcuffed. Uh, so look at the procedure, see what you can improve, and uh, that's the way to go forward. Do you think they came out too quickly to say all the protocol was followed, uh, short of an investigation, you know, I'm expecting we'll get more information about this, but does it put the state in a difficult position as well, again, when an instance of violence happens against an individual, uh, obviously legal actions are a concern. Yeah. Was that, when you heard that, was that sort of your thought on? Absolutely. Uh, Cornell Young, you're always going to have a, a, a lawsuit, is what I was thinking. Here come the lawsuits. The uh, poor victim that's in the hospital, probably surrounded by lawyers, with, uh, hoping to represent it. I mean, that's just the reality. That's a reality. It's a difficult situation. You've, again, been that in that seat as governor and the head of the state police. So I just wanted to ask you your reaction to that. Speaking of reactions, job numbers out again today. Uh, they lost, Rhode Island lost 200 jobs over the last month, but the last three months, 3,900 jobs. I mean, what's your thoughts when you hear that, when there's talk of the economy being on the rebound, we're supposed to be on the upswing, 3,900 jobs in three months? Yes, uh, the, the shooting kind of uh, took over all the news, and so there's a, a lot of other news out there, uh, and this is one, certainly the, uh, uh, Amazon proposal that surrounded the state house is another uh, news item that kind What'd of you got, think of that? got lost in the, the whole shooting <laughs> coverage. What do you think uh, of the Amazon it's proposal? It's just unbelievable that this is a proposal uh, and that there's no Blue Cross building, am I right? There's no GTEC building in the renderings and the Capitol Center Commissioner is saying that this is a non-starter. Uh, so is Amazon going to look at this proposal and say, oh yes, we'll come into Rhode Island where we're going to get into a hornet's nest? Uh, I don't think so. We had asked the architect too and they said it was a creative rendering, but you look closely and you said some of them they were missing and then there were a lot of buildings, where government buildings are right behind the state house right now yeah. as well. So do you think Rhode Island ever had a shot from the outset at Amazon? Of course I do. Of course I do. You've got to put your best foot forward. And I know you. we were in touch and saying, what would I do? And I would market the airport district. Mm. Uh, you've got the train station, you've got the uh, highways, 95, and you've got the airport. There's three transportation hubs right there. Mm. And if the real estate's ready to go, you're not going to have any controversies, no hornet's nest there. <laughs> we're going to be able to uh, welcome that, come on in. That's exactly what it was designed for, uh, connecting the closest Amtrak to an airport uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, plus you have the highways. So that's a natural. A big airport supporter. And it'll be interesting to see a lot of folks are saying Amazon, Boston might be a very serious contender. And we
we might find ourselves in a similar situation to a GE that we ended up getting some jobs. Now Amazon's in a little different position than GE is right now, but we put a lot of incentives out for GE to come here. And now we see GE in a lot of trouble talking about cutting jobs in Boston. You know, they talked about 100 jobs here. And I know we've talked in the past about, you know, these big incentives for big companies to come. But what's your thoughts with that? I mean, again, putting sort of your eggs in that basket. Well, speaking of incentives, uh, just last night, the 195 Commission uh, cut the value of uh, an insider getting land in the 195 land from 1.5 million down in half to $750,000. This is a contributor to the governor, and I talked about dirty money. Here's a perfect example. And plus, the developer has already gotten $3.5 million uh, uh, to build this project. So cutting the land, and this is, this is our valuable, valuable 195 land mm. that's never going to be available again. And this is an apartment building, not a big employer. Yes, good construction jobs, but after that, it's an apartment building. So a lot of mistakes being made, I think, and probably, just being a politician, it's just wanting to get cranes in the air too quickly for an election year, and that's never smart. Do you think it sets a dangerous precedent for the other parcels of 195 that you say to developers, well, the, the final the final sticker price might not be the final sticker price? <laughs> Absolutely. You get an appraiser, and you put the, the number on it, and that's the number. And you just be patient. It's going to happen. You talked about Boston and uh, some of the trouble there. Real estate values are so hot there. They just can't con no. con continue. And also, uh, for their workers, where do you live in Boston? And so these, uh, the Worcesters, the Springfields, the Providence, the New Bedfords, the, uh, we're going to, our day is going to come. <laughs> well, we talked, I know we've talked in the past about the Pawtucket Red Sox, again, as we had one of, uh, one of the supporters in yesterday said they were in the seventh inning stretch here. And it's obviously a very hot topic, very hot topic, a hot button issue for folks. And so what's your thoughts? Should the General Assembly move forward with this legislation? Should it go before the voters? Well, again, I have to give Go Local credit again. Uh, you did the poll. Uh, you spent the money. He said, I do polling as a politician. It costs money. It costs money. <laughs> and uh, it's not, uh, it, they're not cheap. No. But you did it. Yep. And there are the numbers. Rhode Islanders don't want it. Mm. And if you're a politician, such as the Speaker is, or anybody in the House or the Senate, uh, you're going to uh, not like those numbers that came out in the poll. And they're probably, I think they're accurate. And the other difficulty with the Paul uh proposal is that we don't own that apex land. <laughs> and it's only, only in Rhode Island. It's the whole 38 studios all over again. We're going uh, 90 miles an hour with a project in which we don't own the land. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens moving forward. We and just you, you don't want to do a condemnation. You don't, just don't want to start down that road uh, for wealthy owners of a Paul Sox team to condemn somebody's property that they own mm. uh, and go to eminent domain, domain and all that. Uh, legal entanglements. Speaking of da dangerous precedents, talking about 195 and the, the values, but let's talk to politics. Uh, Bob Flanders announced today his run for U.S. Senate. Uh, Representative Bobby Nardolillo has already tossed his hat in the ring, again eyeing Senator Whitehouse. What's your thoughts on that race? Well, it's hard to be a Republican uh, right now, and uh, that's just reality. I lost my re-elect for the Senate in 2006 just because I was a Republican. I believe I had high approval ratings. People had with the performance I was, did as uh, senator, bringing all that federal money to Rhode Island. Uh, but I lost just because I was a Republican. And I think Brendan Doherty, who ran for uh, Congress, uh, had that experience. Just having that R in your name is an anchor because so many Rhode Islanders are going, especially if you're running for Congress, mm -hmm. uh, congressman or Senate, because they're going to look at the numbers, the makeup, who's going to control the committees in the Senate and in the House. Uh, running for governor is a little different because you don't have that dynamic. Uh, but certainly for uh, Bob Flanders and Nando Lillo, uh, that's going to be, as I said, it's going to be a tough anchor to drag. So speaking of uh, the, the letter next to the name, if, if a former governor were to get in the race to, for Rhode Island governor, Democrat or independent? I've jumped around enough, Kate. <laughs> I've now made my bed. I'm a Democrat. I was a Republican. I won as a Republican. I was an independent. I won as an independent. And I found it, I found it hard to govern as an independent. No others have been successful at it, but mm -hmm. you need a party behind you, someone with your back. I didn't have that as an independent. 
and so I joined the Democrat Party. I'm staying <laughs> Democrat. Staying squarely as a D. And you talked with the Washington Examiner this weekend about the DNC. Talked about Donna Brazil's book about what transpired during the election. You had some very strong thoughts, clearly, about the Clinton campaign, how it was running. You said if Bernie, you thought Bernie would have won if he was the Democratic nominee. Yes, and this all is because we have Donald Trump as our president. And so we as Democrats, I believe, should be doing a lot of soul searching as to how we let that happen. And Donna Brazil started the conversation, and she got hammered. They don't even want to hear it. But the bottom line is we lost to Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton was not our best candidate, and that's why I got in the race. Everyone laughed and said, what's Shafee doing? I just didn't think Hillary Clinton was a good candidate. I served with her in the Senate. Uh, she voted for the war. It was a colossally poor decision. Uh, there was all the ethical issues, and I talked about that in the campaign, and people kept uh, beating me up and saying uh, that she's our, she's our gal, she's getting in line, and, and we lost. And so uh, I was happy to hear Donald Brazil start the conversation. And I, she's absolutely right. It was rigged. And I, you know, I was in the race for a little bit, and I experienced it. It was rigged. Do you think her, I mean, her comments are very, uh, uh, you know, uh, for what they're worth, I mean, just starting this fire within the Democratic Party. But do you think they resonate with the Bernie supporters, for instance? I mean, is there a fissure in the Democratic Party that you'd say? Yeah, you're right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you talk to any of the Sanders people, and they, they see Donna, Donna Brazil is absolutely right. She wasn't, uh, Bernie wasn't, Senator Sanders was not given the same level of support. And he was taking off the crowds he was attracting all across the country and across different demographic groups and ages. Uh, it was a phenomenon. And the, the key was that the people wanted an outsider. That was Trump. They had it on their side, the Republicans. We had Sanders on our side, and we went with an establishment candidate, just what the public <laughs> didn't want, the, the, the personification of establishment in Hillary Clinton, we lost. Now, do you consider yourself sort of anti-establishment? I mean, you've been in politics for a while, but having gone from Republican to independent to Democrat, would you give yourself that sort of maverick label to say, I'm not establishment? Good question. Um, because I've you could say I'm an establishment. People said that about Senator Sanders. Hey, he's been in the House all those years. He's in the Senate all those years. Uh, but I think I, I take on the establishment. I took him on the Bush tax cuts. I took him on on uh, the Iraq War. I took on the establishment on Hillary Clinton being the Democratic nominee. I got in the race just because I didn't think there were only four of us that were brave enough to do it. Uh, so I didn't think she was a good candidate. So I think I've earned the anti-establishment <laughs> tag. But with some experience, I've got my bruises to show for it. <laughs> Roll up the sleeves. Let's I see over here. Bruises to show for it. <laughs> so, what will it take to again make you make that decision whether or not you're going to toss your hat in this ring one more time? I, I just want to take my time, and uh, I think I have some time to do that. You, uh, I've learned through all these races that I've been in what twelve different races. Uh, sometimes you're in; it's too long of a campaign, mm. and uh, I want to see what happens with the budget next year. I see big, big problems coming, and that's the bottom line. Yeah. But you gotta run black ink. And it looks like another $60 million deficit was announced today uh, because they're not controlling their spending. And the, the legislative side, I saw, saw their quotes, and they're very frustrated with the executive branch because they're not controlling the spending. And that's the executive's job. Legislators can't do that. They can't say, manage DCYF better, manage corrections better, manage DOT better, manage DEM better. That's the executive side, and they're not doing it. Do you, do you feel, you can sense it, do you feel that frustration as you're here watching from the position that you had once been in, saying, I would do this so much differently? Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, I just don't like the cliches, we're tightening our belt and all that. We've got to do it. <laughs> and now there's an early incentive, early retirement program. You raised flags about yeah. that beginning of November. You yeah. sent those comments yeah. out. I mean, almost from a legal standpoint, yes. could the state be doing this? And yes. it looks like they're mo you know, moving forward. Yes, and I don't think it's going to be successful because people, you know, when you're waiting for retirement, you're counting the days and months and weeks, and uh, they're going to pay people to retire even though they're eligible. They're going to retire anyway. Maybe you'll get some that will go because of the extra money. But I think a lot of people are going to retire and, uh, and then get the bonus on top of it. So we'll see. And you mentioned as well the impact on, again, that agreement. I believe it was 2015 about how this impacts the COLAs of the existing yes. retirees. I mean, yes. that was part and parcel yes. with it as well. Do you think the existing retirees who were impacted, and again, this 2015 settlement addressed 
feel that frustration looking at what's going on right now? Well, after I sent out the release, the uh, retirement board chaired by the treasurer, Seth Magaziner, put it on the agenda, and I was very happy to see that. I don't know if it was my press release that did it, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, they discussed... But I imagine it might have a, a role. <laughs> <laughs> they did discuss, uh, got their actuaries in to discuss how this might affect the return of the COLAs for our retirees. And they report that they don't know yet. They mm. don't know how many people are going to retire uh, through this program. Uh, but they thought it would not uh, greatly affect the, the return of the COLA. So that was good to see. So speaking of keeping an eye on things, I know we're looking to see if you make any moves. But down in Washington, tax reform, following what's going on down there, what do you think of what you've seen from down there so far? I don't think they have the votes. And I didn't think so right from the beginning. Uh, it's 52-48 in the Senate. <laughs> And uh, John McCain is not uh, a fan of uh, the President Trump's. And then you have uh, Senator Cor These are Republicans. Senator oh, yeah. Corker, <laughs> Senator Flake, Senator Collins, and now Senator Johnson. These are Republicans, don't forget. Johnson from uh, Wisconsin saying he, he's, he doesn't think uh, this is a good proposal. That's a lot of Republicans. It, it, when it's 52-48, <laughs> it doesn't take too many. Uh, don't have a lot of wiggle room. <laughs> not a lot of wiggle room. So, and I also felt, since I was there for the Bush tax cuts, the, the, the middle class knows that this doesn't work for them. They, they've been sold a bill of goods once before, and there's going to be an uprising uh, against the, all these tax cuts that benefit the 1%. It's wrong. So you talk about the uprising and to come back to state politics and Rhode Island constituents who you know so well. I mean, we did see, obviously, Bernie Sanders defeat Hillary Clinton here. Um, you know, is Rhode Island sort of ripe for that? Will we see more ousters, do you think, with people saying we want new faces and new leadership. Uh, yeah, uh, it's happened in some specials already. Uh, the former Senate President, Teresa Piper Weeds, hand-picked candidate in Newport did not win nope. against kind of a Sanders-type uh, insurrection candidate. <laughs> and uh, I do think there's going to be some anger that even though Senator Sanders won big in Rhode Island in the primary, our superdelegates all went down and voted for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when the final tally came in in Rhode Island and they called the roll at the convention, it was close. And it shouldn't have been because of all those super delegates voting for uh, Clinton. That's what primaries are for. We send our entourage down there to support who the people supported, and it didn't happen. Did not happen. Do you get the and sense? Then we lost to Trump on top of it. Do you get the sense there's a lot of talk? I mean, folks feel that you know 2016 and the election sort of hasn't gone away; that we're still sort of reeling from those ramifications of it. Is that a, sort of an accurate assessment of where we stand right now in it's 2017? A year. That's it's a, a year. year. That's a year. And we're still reeling. I think so. And Donna Brazil, a year later, comes out with her book, and she gets hammered. It's way overdue to have some introspection about. Uh, how Democrats could so, <laughs> screw up so badly. Do you think Just, she's facing I, I would consider Donald Trump unelectable. <clears throat> he never held elective office. Uh, not even a councilman, a mayor, a, a senator, a congressman. Uh, no experience at this. And, and Hillary Clinton lost to him. Do you think he's finding out the hard way, just how hard it is to, to get things accomplished on Capitol Hill? <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a saying, don't insult the crocodile before you cross the stream. And he <laughs> seems to insult all those senators, and, uh, and then he asks them for their vote. Uh, uh, it doesn't work. That doesn't work well. We uh, continue to, to keep it The crocodile will get you sooner or later. The crocodile will get you anytime. So let's just finish as well, because you know, you've always had an eye to international relations and what we're seeing with North Korea right now and where what we're hearing from the president as well. I mean, how concerned are you about the situation with North Korea? Not at all. Um, it, it, they're just looking for attention, is my view. And uh, Russia and China both have borders on no, with North Korea. That's their problem. Uh, and. Uh, I just, I wouldn't, I'd ignore, ignore them. You don't think that, I mean, people are trying to gin up, uh, you know, potentially for the president to take nuclear action. Is yeah, that no, a feasible no. scenario? Absolutely not. It's a uh, military-industrial complex at work. Well, speaking of We can sell more spending, bombers, more weapons. We just had a pretty hefty price tag approved, so it's, it, as you said, military-industrial. So as you look to make a decision here, what are the next few weeks looking like for you, kind of moving forward, keeping an eye on things here in Rhode Island? Nothing different, uh, and we'll just uh, see what happens with the budget especially. That's 
uh, the, May, the November revenue estimates are coming out now and they're not good. Uh, and then the governor has to put together a budget and propose it in uh, February, January or February and see what that looks like. These are not going to be easy decisions. And all these mistakes of giving all the money to the corporation, General Electric, Johnson Johnson, uh, the donors at the 195 land. Uh, slashing the price gonna, tag. <laughs> yeah, slashing the are going to come back. Uh, because it, eventually you have to have black ink. That's the law. That, yes, black ink indeed. Well, I appreciate you coming back in because you've been, you know, opining on a lot of things taking place both here and nationally. And again, keeping an eye maybe on that decision here in Rhode Island. I'm sure we'll talk with you soon. Next time I'll uh, have a solution for North Korea. <laughs> okay, you heard it here. <laughs> Senator James, a solution to North Korea. I appreciate you taking the time to come in. We'll let you go around the corner and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Senator.